live from Buceria Studios in Hamburg and from my house in Chicago, Illinois. It's the 2021 edition of Bucerius Legal Tech's Essentials. I'm Dan Katz, professor at Illinois Tech Chicago Kent College of Law and academic director of the new Buceria Center for Legal Technology and Data Science. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to our pre-session focused on legal, tech, legal Technology and Operations 101. We'll begin our regular session on Monday, May, uh, May 3rd. And before I pass it over to Dirk to, to kick us off here, I just wanted to uh, invite folks, I see folks already doing this, but to, uh, to say hello and where you're from. We have a large community of folks from all around the world who, uh, uh, who participate in these sessions. And it's great to have, great to be back uh, uh, here once again. So with no further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Dirk and Homber. Over to you, Dirk. Thank you, Dan. And uh, welcome everybody from, from our side here in Hamburg. Uh, I'm really excited that we're doing this for the second year in a row. I know that many of you are repeat offenders and have joined us last year as well. And I will start as you always do with a good uh, Zoom webinar uh, by sharing my screen. So Legal Technology 101. But before we get into the substantive matter of, to, of tonight's lecture, let's talk a bit about Bucerios Law School. I've chosen to uh, show you our new year of students. Everything's been a bit different, as you can see by the distance that people had to put between themselves for security purposes when taking this photo. But this truly represents what our school stands for. We are a private, small institution in Germany in a market where most of legal education is actually done publicly in large schools. We're situated in Hamburg in Northern Germany. And here you can see one full year of students. In total, we have four to five years of students on campus, preparing them for the bar exam. And if you count PhD students and our master's students, we're a small community of roughly 600 people. So there are probably more people on this webinar right now than typically in our school. And that's exciting for us. Bucerios Law School tends to be brave. This is our core value. If you wonder what that means, Mut is German for brave, and you'll see it um, appearing in different places around. You can actually see it right behind me here in our background. It is our core and most important value. We think you have to be brave to start new things. We started the Legal Tech Essentials, an open admissions program for everyone all over the world. It's been a great ride last year, and I'm looking forward to what we'll see this year. Generally, in the CHE ranking, which is Germany's most important ranking, Bucerios Law School has been doing well over the last couple of years. It is only taken every third year, so just so you know, we're not leaving out bad results. But typically, this is regarded as good institutions to study law. And we hope that what we bring to you over the course of the next four weeks will be equally pleasing. We, that's the Bucerios uh, Center for Legal Technology and Data Science. It's a fairly new center. We were founded roughly a year ago. So I think it's somewhere around this time, it's our anniversary actually, but this had been in the making for quite some time. There are a couple of people here. There's Dan, whom you've already met. You're listening to me right now and you will get to know Larry in a minute. We are running this center and we're taking care of technology education on our campus, of making sure that legal technology and innovation is, is known all throughout Germany and Europe. We're part of a great international network but we're also researchers and scientists. This is our legal data science research group. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge all of its members, uh, Janis Bekedorf, Mike Bomarito, Corinna Coupet, and then Dan and myself. And if you want a working sample of what we're doing, here are our two latest papers, one focusing on the growth in uh, regulatory material and uh, mostly statutes in the United States and Germany. And the other one just accepted today, yay, um, in, in uh, frontiers in physics, that deals about or deals with measuring law over time. Um, those are fairly long articles, but if you want to enjoy them, here are the links, and we will make sure that you have access to them also in the materials section. If you need a shorter version, more condensed one, there is a link here. It's a short slide deck that explains some of the main findings. There'll be more about that in the future, but you're probably not here only to hear about our research, right? So. Let's talk about who made this possible. Because I talked about Bucerios, and this certainly is an important institution, but this is an effort by many people at many institutions collaboratively over a long time. There's, of course, Chicago Kent College of Law, Dan's primary home institution. 
Then there is uh, CODEX, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, of which, with which both Dan and I are affiliated. And you will hear from their director, Roland Vogel, uh, very soon in one of our first sessions. Our great friends at ELTA and Legal Hackers are community members that help us spread the word and that in actually share our mission of, of thinking about this topic, of bringing this topic out there to the world. And we're very grateful that they're with us on this journey. But you know, everybody likes to party, though most important is who actually pays for it. That is SMP. Uh, SMP is, is a law firm and we'll hear, hear about that a bit more from, from their CEO, Harry of Wenzler. We have a quick word from our sponsor and I particularly like uh, Harry of to tell us why they decided to join us for this program and why they actually made it possible. Harry Ulf, over to you. Hi, Dirk. Um, hi, Dan. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, thank you for having me uh, saying a word of hello from the sponsor. SMP is a proud sponsor of Pusera's Legal Tech Essentials uh, because we know how important it is and how important um, not just legal education, but also the world that lies within practices for uh, young lawyers, um, law students, and especially knowledge of technology, of operations, of processes, uh, and of all the things that lie behind the core of law is what we appreciate in our, what we call the next generation law firm. So SMP is a proud sponsor of this excellent program. We have seen it uh, flourish uh, last year. Uh, we would have preferred to be on campus and to meet with all of you. But on the other hand, it's, it's just great to see how many people are uh, have involved for this program. Uh, and we appreciate the fact that there is such a fine faculty delivering these uh, excellent classes. And to be a sponsor of this program is a thing that we're really proud of. We wish you um, success, uh, luck, and just enjoy as much as you can with these uh, great folks here on the program. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you, Harry Off. And I think it's the absolute truth when we say that this would not have been possible without you, because as you may know, we value the time of our lecturers. Putting together all of this requires resources. And it's really for the folks over at SMP that this became possible. So thank you from our side and probably from all of our participants as well. That was the word from our sponsor. Let's now continue over with some administrative announcements and my colleague, Larry. Hi. Hi from behind the scenes. Um, my name is Lauritz Gerlach, and I work with Dirk and Dan at the Center for Legal Technology and Data Science here at Butzeros Law School. And before we start, I would like to make some short administrative announcements about this year's program. First off, emails. Our primary way of communicating with you will be through email. So to make sure to check your spam folder every now and then to make sure you don't miss anything. If our emails land in your spam folder, consider putting these two addresses, essentials at lawschool.de and dirkhartung at lawschool.de on your email client's allow list so they are never classified as spam. During the program, you can expect two kinds of emails from us. There will be a weekly roundup of what to expect for the coming week with Zoom links and additional info. These will, send, these will be sent out every Sunday. And in these emails, you will also find a link to a Dropbox folder that contains all slides um, and additional materials for, from each lecture. Um, so if you're the kind of person that likes to look at the slides after the talk, we've got you covered. And there will also be reminders on the day of each webinar, around one hour before it starts, just like you got one today. Second, recordings. Uh, to many of you, especially those in the Asia Pacific time zones, uh, recordings, this is a topic that's very important to you. And so I'd like to take a minute to introduce what we're doing this year. There will be recordings for nearly all lectures. We need some time to edit those. So they will go online with a delay of maybe one week after each webinar. The recordings will be available for all participants and they will be available for the duration of this year's program. Third, there are many advantages to teaching over the internet. There are also some drawbacks. Most importantly, it's not as easy to meet fellow learners and to engage in a discussion. And that's why we hope to continue these conversations on social media. There is a LinkedIn group that you can find at this link uh, here, uh, butseri.us slash essentials dash group. And it's the best place to connect with fellow participants and some of our lecturers. We currently have about 2,300 people in that group. 
Also, the, the conversation continues on Twitter after each lecture and between sessions at the hashtag, hashtag Buceos Legal Tech. Now, I promised you three things, but I'm going to deliver one more. Um, I have some bonus content because we are often asked about a certificate for this class. Just like last year, we cannot provide an academic certificate or a degree because for that, we would need to have an application or a selection process. And also because we don't have an exam or a quiz or some way to test people's knowledge after the program. However, this year we are offering an attendance record uh, for those who need it. And you know who you are. This can be useful to show to your employer, to apply for CLE credits, etc. The attendance record will be provided uh, through our friends at Butzelius Law School's Executive Education Subsidiary, Butzelius Education GmbH, and we will hand these out at the price of what it costs us to make them at our accounting cost. Um, and so if you are interested in the attendance record, you can buy it at the link in our FAQs on the website. Now, to reiterate and to clarify, this is completely optional. Um, the program itself is completely free, just like last year. Um, you can come here every day, you can watch the lecture for free, and if you want to, and only then, uh, can you buy an attendance record. Now that concludes my part. If you have any questions about the program that I haven't answered yet, uh, drop them in the Q&A uh, down below in, uh, during this presentation. I'll be here the entire time and I'll answer your questions. That's also a great opportunity to practice how questions work. Um, if you have a question today or in the coming webinars, use the Q&A feature in Zoom and not the chat because in the chat, that, the chat gets crowded as you can see and your question might get lost. Um, so if you use the Q&A feature, we can organize your questions and make sure we get to most, if not all of them. And with that, I'll hand it over to Daniel Martin Katz, who will get us started with Legal Technology 101. Dan? Thanks, Larry. And uh, it's great, great, as, uh, uh, great again to be back uh, uh, for the 2021 edition. So this is our pre-session. And the purpose of the pre-session is kind of to, uh, to get everyone going uh, so that this is going to uh, for those of you we had uh, who were here last year, this will be largely duplicative. But for those of you who are new or would like to hear it for a second time, uh, uh, we're we're offering this kind of pre-session so that we can begin on Monday in earnest, kind of uh, uh, move things along. So in the com over the coming weeks, uh, we're going to cover a variety of different topics. At, this is just a subset, but topics like artificial intelligence, process improvement, design thinking, different types of economic or business models entrepreneurship, the topic of legal operations, digital justice and, and online courts, and this topic of legal complexity. And I think if you look at all these, these topics, they collectively share, their, they, uh, these ideas are related to a shared, or they share a vision, which is bringing operational excellence to law. And um, in that vein, uh, um, uh, I think, you know, we would bucket it out as people process technology. Many other folks would kind of look at it that way. Uh, uh, so we're going to focus. The people part is kind of traditional law, uh, although the one thing you could say is this notion of multidisciplinary teams. But we're really going to focus on the process and tech component uh, um, at, of of uh, uh, of how to make law better, operationally better. So when we talk about operational excellence, it's particularly a focus on process and tech, but it does involve people as well, particularly the, the uh, uh, construction of multidisciplinary teams. By the way, um, we call this Bucerius Legal Tech Essentials, and I just wanna make sure that it's clear what we mean by that. This is kind of the appetizer version of, of a broader program, which which hopefully uh, 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 we will have uh, uh, um, you know next next summer, and we welcome uh, we'll welcome uh, folks to join us in Hamburg for a three week program uh, in in the summer of 2022. So uh, more information on that will be forthcoming. If you're on the email list and you're on this webinar, then you're on the email list. Then we'll send you information about that later later in 2021 uh, to to see you hopefully in 2022 in person. Okay, so today, uh, again, we wanna do an introduction to the field. So Dirk and I are gonna divide the time up. Uh, I'm gonna cover some stuff and then I'm gonna pass it over to Dirk uh, to, uh, uh, for sort of the second half of, of, of our today's presentation. Now, I believe that, that introductions to these topics are kind of done best done at say 30 miles an hour uh, at kind of some, some level of speed. In other words, if, there are, if there's terminology or ideas that I 
set forth or that Dirk sets forth that are somewhat unfamiliar, uh, start looking around because there's been quite a, li- a lot written about the topics that we're going to discuss in here. Uh, so if you, it's sort of like when you, if you, uh, for those of you who, who are, uh, have a law background, when you were first in law school and they started using certain types of law terms that you never heard before, like what does replevin mean or something like this, you had to look it up. And that's the same thing here. So some of these terms are, will be familiar to you and some will not. So just write the stuff down and then explore them offline. So this is meant to kind of uh, get you cooking on, on a bunch of these things to which there's a lot more detail. For example, our first session on Monday, I'm going to talk about AI. It's a very uh, a, a AI generally and the AI applied to the law. Uh, obviously, that's a very rich topic to which many things could be said. So you you start backfilling any knowledge gaps you have and, and, and this will help, you know, over the course of this set, these sessions and in the months to follow, help you sort of uh, uh, put you on a path in these topics. Uh, uh, that's our, that's our, that's our hope. Okay. So I think in terms of level setting, this, this session has the expectation that maybe, you know, you don't really have a lot of background in all of these. That's why it's our pre-session of these topics. So what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to go back to the beginning of the last decade. And I'd like to talk about kind of what happened in that decade as a means to kind of bring you up to speed. Okay. And so when we say, when I say 2010, I would argue that the story really starts here. It starts with a financial crisis. It, it starts with the compression, the global compression on the, the world's largest companies who, by the way, spend the vast majority of the resources spent in legal money spent in legal is being done by say the 5,000 largest organizations on earth, whether they're big companies or nonprofits or what have you, but these 5,000 ish organizations do most of the expenditure and the financial crisis put economic pressure on many of these organizations. And when economic pressure comes to an organization, what they typically do is they go across the, organization and they begin to say, we need to cut our budget. Every unit within this organization needs to cut their budget by some amount, 10%, 15%, 20%. That's the impetus. In some sense, that's the connection that I hope to draw for you. That'll be a theme throughout these sessions, which is innovative ideas alone aren't going to solve the problem. You have to connect typically innovation with economics somehow, somehow. And so there were many of these ideas that start to grow, start to come to market in the 2010s, existed before before that period. And you'll find companies and you'll find people who champion these ideas. But they it was hard to get a foothold until the economic conditions created a demand to work differently, to do things differently. And so the crisis placed significant pressure on many organizations to operate in a more cost-effective manner. And that began to change some of the atmospheric conditions, let's call it. Now, that's not true in every organization, but it was true in enough of them that it created the resources necessary for people who were interested in innovation to be able to come uh, to come forward and build viable organizations. So that allowed what you might say is the first wave of innovation to enter the field. Now, what, what was some of the manifestation of that? One thing that we certainly saw was the so-called robot lawyers thesis. Uh, at, you saw story after story after story about so-called ro- robot lawyers. Now, often the said robot lawyer, we'll talk about this on Monday, but this so-called robot lawyer is really just um, a, something like a, a, an expert system, uh, which again, we'll get into all of this, uh, which the technology exist, has existed since you know at least the 1980s, if not earlier. Uh, and so it's not really a robot in any sense. First of all, it's not a robot because um, it's not a physical robot. It's, it would be in cloud, in cloud in the cloud, but even notwithstanding, um, many of the robot lawyers really aren't even, they're not robots and uh, um, they're, they're only doing a very cursory thing within law. But enough of, there's enough opportunity within this space because this is a very sleepy space historically from an innovation perspective until the 2010s. Very sleepy, meaning, you know, lots of, uh, um, lots of innovation we saw in the broader economy. Somehow um, this field was immune to, uh, to many of those, those techniques and principles, but less so now, less so now. But it takes time. Things don't happen overnight. It's not you wake up one day and the whole world is completely different. 
So one of the things we hope to show you that it's not just one disruptor per se, it's not just robot lawyers, but a series of trends that kind of highlighted the, uh, uh, the, the rise of legal innovation as a field, the rise of legal tech and innovation. So it is certainly the case that there was legal tech before 2010, no doubt, but this is the last decade is when legal tech came of age. First of all, you saw uh, legal technology go from what might be called the hacker community, the group of, um, including our friends at uh, Legal Hackers Hamburg, uh, uh, but there, there were groups of people getting together to try to work, to think about how one might work differently. Now, if you go back to the beginning, to the earlier part of the 2010s, it's more of something akin to the Homebrew Computer Club, which um, if you know your history of Silicon Valley, the Homebrew Computer Club was the a group of technology enthusiasts who got together um, in the 1970s and early 1980s and were interested, they, they were interested in tinkering with computers. That's before the personal computing industry really took off. But you see your Steve Jobs and Wozniak's and Bill Gates interested in computing, but it's still more of folks in their garage, uh, a community, not kind of mainstream industry. But you start to see people get together and think about how one can work differently. And we see a global community of folks interested in, in um, change within law. And by the way, uh, if you have not heard of legal hackers or, uh, uh, or if there's not a legal hacker location near you, you could start one. Or you can join up perhaps with the one that's closest to you. But it, there really are uh, communities now all around the world. What happened, what you see is a, a familiar story if you look outside of our sector, which is um, things, begin out, things begin at the periphery and become part of the mainstream. So we see the kind of legal hackers on the outside of the industry, but all of a sudden you start to see some of this within the industry, within the traditional mainstream industry. So more on that in a second. But in the 2010s, we saw significant growth in the sheer number of legal technology startups. And... There are, of course, a variety of different lists out there that one can take a look at. Uh, Angel List is a, is a list of venture-seeking or venture-backed startups. And if you, if you went to Angel List and you typed in legal tech, you'd see like 1,500 companies. If you went in uh, and you typed in uh, um, right now, I just checked it this morning. If, if you typed in legal, you'd see over 2,500 companies. Now, it's not a perfectly curated list, but it gives you a directional kind of notion here. The Stanford list is a better list. It ha it's a little more curated. One thing I'd say about the Stanford list, it, has, it does not have every company on it. Neither one of these lists has every company. So the point is to show you, if you went back to the 2010s, you'd have difficulty rounding up one to 200 companies globally. So we saw in the 2010s, something like 10x growth 10 times growth in the number of sheer, uh, 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 sheer volume of companies. Now, some companies succeed and some companies uh, fail, which is just kind of the nature of it. it's a high risk kind of exercise to start a company. But I think collectively, if you look at it, it starts at the individual level at, hey, here's a way we might do something differently. And then it becomes a company. Collectively, a bunch of people sort of saw this as an opportunity uh, uh, to start a company and to try to bring these ideas out. And, and the growth, I think, really speaks to that. I would say it kind of began more as a un United States, UK phenomenon at towards the beginning of the decade. Doesn't mean there aren't exceptions to this, but we see acceleration then in the, 20, in the 2010s all over the world. It becomes, a, we're going to have a panel later on uh, in our sessions where we're going to have um, representatives from different parts of the world uh, kind of give us a, uh, we don't have every single place covered, but we're trying to give it a decent amount of breadth to it uh, uh, of different places around the world where we see growth of legal technology uh, companies. So each, um, each logo on here is a company who's make, doing something within the space. And you see different taxonomies like this that try to group or classify them by topic. And for every, you know, these aren't necessarily exhaustive, but it just sort of shows you that these markets are really are really, are really moving now all over the world. And I think just from the folks we see on this, uh, uh, on this series, the, in, the, the interest all around the world, it's really exciting. It's really exciting. So 
The other thing we saw, especially towards the end of the 2010s, is economic investment, venture capital. So historically, people said, look, I'm not going to invest. This is VCs now, right? I'm not going to invest in anything where government adoption is, is core to the business model or anything involving lawyers because the economics of the industry are all messed up and we're going to burn up a bunch of cash trying and it's just not worth it. Now, you know, the, the world of innovation is this. Things transitioning from sounds like a bad idea to great idea or good, good or great idea. And somewhere along the way, enough people sort of got the view, hey, this actually is an industry that there's a possibility of, of really doing something with from a build a company, invest in a company and, and grow capital uh, uh, perspective. And why I like to highlight this is, you know, think about what these decisions are. Somebody has to go in front of a VC or um, another, uh, another kind of um, entity that d d deploys capital and convince them to invest in this over all the other ideas that are out there. And so certainly uh, there's been a lot of capital invested and not all of those have worked out, but I think it directionally starts, it's, it helps fill in the story from a directional perspective. So you see all these companies being created, you see this money coming in. And I think it's very, I'm very comfortable with saying we've had at least 2000 companies I think very easily can say this. It's probably more. It's probably 2,500 or more, maybe 3,000. It's hard to know. I always, it seems like every day I hear about a new company that I've never heard of before. Uh, um, so it, you know, I don't, I don't purport. I'm just directionally, I mean, it's pretty easy to get to 2,000 just from the two lists if you take the, if you take the superset of those, but it's even beyond that. The other thing to note, by the way, is it's not as though, the line between legal tech and these five other topics is hermetically sealed, like reg tech and deal tech and some of the topics within fintech or insurance tech or gov tech sound a heck of a lot like legal tech. And the line between these things is very unclear on the margins. At the extremes, I know the difference, obviously. But on the margins, you could easily make a case that one of these reg tech companies or gov tech companies or what have you is literally is a legal tech company. So the point is, it's an even more expansive uh, uh, kind of note. You can take a more expansive notion and even get bigger numbers this way. Now, back to the mainstream industry. So all this, all of this activity is taking place, commercial activity. And you know, I've worked with a lot of law firms over the years, one form or another. And here's what you you see from management. They say, you know go back again to the middle of the 2010s. People say, you know, I see all this activity. How do we engage with it? How do we engage with it? Because certainly not every company in there is makes sense for us as a firm or what have you, but at least some of this, we need to figure out what to make of all that and how, how to um, figure out, say, which flowers to pick. So let's go back five years, about well, six years ago, five or six years ago. Denton's was the first law firm to create a an accelerator and it was you know and so this was a brand new kind of idea no law firm uh, no law firm had really done something like this and uh, i'm not really as involved i'm not really involved in this anymore but it was it was very exciting to see a law firm say you know what um we want to see what's out there and we want to do some venture investment and we also want to be able to kind of um be part of an investment syndicate so sort of you know Denton's gives you the good housekeeping seal of approval, and then other VCs don't who don't know the space basically look for uh, folks who, who do know the space to to identify what's a valid opportunity. And the other thing that that the firm kind of offered was, hey, you can you can pilot these ideas right in here inside the firm. So, other that one thing that's true about law, it's true about like investment banks and other things like this, which is if one person has a good idea. Lots of other people kind of follow on with their own version. And I call these engagement frameworks because not every firm took the exact same perspective, but you see different, different firms doing different things with the general notion of figuring out how do we make, how do we take what's going on and, and kind of roll it into what we're doing here inside of our law firm. And so different firms do, again, different things. Some even build products. So a, a variety of different tacks are taken. And by the way, I'm not showing you every firm that did anything. This is just meant to be illustrative of what's out there. 
and on and on it goes. Now, let's go to the other side of the equation, which is the buyer, the customer, the client, if you will. So what do we see in those, enter those larger enterprises? Well, there was legal operations as a field prior to 2010, but you see great acceleration in the 2010s on the field of legal operations. You start to see more and more companies sitting there with one to N number of people who work, who run legal operations for the, for the, for the company. So what is legal operations? We'll say a lot more about this later on, but the, 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 the general principle is, hey, you go into a company, you'll generally see a COO. That's the head of operations for the whole company. Within, down below, you'll see in each of the divisions of the company, some lieutenant who does heads operations within the division of the company, and they typically re will report up to the COO and maybe report across also to the head of the division. So that's a very traditional structure. Legal historically did not have a person like that in many organizations. That starts to change in the 2010s. And so we see significant increase in the number of operations professionals. We see the, 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 the founding of Clock and the great acceleration of Clock, the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. And uh, that becomes a dynamic. Dirk will say a little bit more about that later on. But that's another thing we see take place. And they start doing information sharing and um, you know, creating taxonomies of how to attack operations kind of from the very, you know, kind of, you know, crawl, you know, walk, run kind of level, you know, what do you do first? What do you do kind of in, in intermediate maturity? What do you do as you uh, get become a more mature organization from an operations perspective? So again, we'll have more on that later with today with Zerk, and we have sessions devoted to this uh, throughout the course of our month together. So many organizations begin their legal ops journeys in the 2010s and are accelerating that as time steps forward. I would say that for many legal orgs, this is the first wave of imposing some level of operational discipline on what they're doing. And one of the dynamics we see is the supply chain is, begins to get re, re, reworked or reassembled. And we move away from everything goes to, you know, uh, uh, one, one provider does everything to a much more federated set of providers. More on that in a moment. Um, now, if you take a step back, though, and I, I, this is just a principle I will refer to, so I want to have said a little bit about it. One of the things that, one of the things that we're very interested in here from an academic perspective, but it's also a very practical perspective, is what is the demand driver for what you could call units of legal production? Like, what is it that drives demand for people to use lawyers or to use legal technology? Uh, units of legal production. That'd be kind of an economist way of talking about it. But we need units of law, law jobs to be done, to be produced by people or by machines or some combination thereof. We would argue that complexity is at least one of the major demand drivers. Complexity. And things like social, economic, and political complexity manifests in our field as legal complexity. So there's rules that are passed by legislatures and regulations put out by, by administrative agencies and, and, and a series of other types of rules and regulations, policies and procedures, and that collectively creates complexity. And that is one of the demand, one of the demand drivers for, for lawyers in the first place is this complexity challenge. So this is somewhat of, it, it's got a sort of a piece to it, which is it's kind of hard to, to describe precisely, to, to define, but this is something that we've academically spent a lot of time on it. Uh, I have individually and uh, the group at Bucerius Legal um, uh, Center for Legal Technology and Data Science, this is one of our big thrusts is the scientific measurement of complexity. So I've been interested in it for a long time. As Dirk noted, we have two recent papers which really try to tackle this idea of of the growth of the complexity of the law and how to measure it. And so we try to measure it both at a given time and then over time. And so I'll just show you one graph from this recent paper, again, got accepted actually today at Frontiers in Physics, which is good news. Um, just take a look at these, these graphics. Let me just tell you what's going on. Two countries, and we see growth in statutes and regulations. So the U.S. grows by like 50% in the volume of law. Uh, statutory law and grows by 250% in the growth of statutory law over 
a, 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 about a 20 year period. So that's what we're talking about. When we talk about the growth of the law. I guess you could say every time a statute or regulation is passed, a lawyer gets their wings or there's a greater demand for some solution to the problem. It doesn't have to be a lawyer. It could be a machine or machine lawyer combination. But virtually every way you measure it, legal complexity has grown. That's kind of the thesis statement. So the question is, how do you match complexity with the appropriate bundle of tools and human capital, meaning people, or people process technology. The legacy model in law historically has been, anytime you see complexity, throw more people at the problem. More, 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 more people. The challenge is you put high, price, high cost labor or even cheaper labor to solve high complexity problems. That doesn't really scale. It doesn't scale to the, you know, people, if I have to, if, if, if it scales at the rate that the law is growing, then you need two and a half times more people than you did 20 years ago. And it's not, there's no evidence it's going to stop anytime soon. So the question is, how are we going to solve this complexity challenge? From a practical standpoint and an economic standpoint, we're going to need a different way of working. And that's the thesis statement of all of this. That's why legal innovation matters. It's, this complexity problem is not going away. So I just want to say overall in the 2010s, I think it's fairly, fairly safe to say that the supply chain began to get disrupted. You used to be as a buyer, hey, I'm going to do law firm A or law firm B, but now we have all these other players. Yeah, many other players. And whether directed internally by corporate counsel or by legal ops or assembled by outside firms or vendors, everybody's sort of trying to become a law company. You can read more about that idea. But another way of saying it is people need to build product service bundles. Don't just throw labor at the problem. Figure out how to leverage technology and people optimally. And that's, that's a big charge for what we're doing here today. Now, the last thing I want to cover today, uh, and, and this will set up one of the sessions, is we want to think about process. So it's people, process, technology. And so tech is a big focus of, this, of these sessions, but process is important too. So there's this idea of thinking like a lawyer. Now I teach at Illinois Tech, the vast majority of what our school does broadly is teach people to think like engineers. And we can learn, an engineer looks at a legal process, they think process diagram and they think in engineering terms. Lawyer, that borrowing some of those ideas can be very useful. And that's gonna take you into these fields, project management and process improvement. If you look across the whole economy, there are many efforts to convert what might be called an artisanal process into an industrial process or the industrialization of the artisan. Now, this is an old idea, by the way, starts at least here, if not earlier, in the wealth of nations. And you look at Adam Smith looking at pin manufacturing. Yeah. Then you see, you know, leading industrialists like Henry Ford, the cost of trying to figure out how to reduce the cost of production through using industrial methods. Then it carries into to the Toyota production system to Lean and Six Sigma. And the goal is you wanna keep the things that have value, but basically streamline uh, uh, the, ar the, artisanal, or the artisanal elements that aren't actually adding value. So I love this, this uh, picture of, of a process, a legal process, if you will. There's a process as you think it is, there's a process as it actually is, and there's a process as it should be. This is uh, one, um, a, a Seifarth diagram, and we'll have John here uh, later in our sessions from Seifarth. But these methodologies, Lean and Six Sigma, I'm, in my view, can help every subsector in law, from a big law firm all the way down to legal aid and everything in between. In legal aid, it's serve more people in the units of, of, of time that are available. Take high volatility processes and try to turn them into lower volatility processes. It doesn't have to be like, you're not gonna get a straight line but you want to go from a world of this to a world of this, if possible. And when you map your processes, you're left with an artifact, like a process map. Now, remember, these are in people's minds. But when you get a large team distributed people, it's very hard to operate unless there's some central ground truth to work from. And that's why these things, among other things, are valuable. Process maps can aid in increasing response times, increase margins on work, help you predict resource loads so you're not it's not feast and famine all the time and help you coordinate across a large number of people. So 
when you have a process map, you can think of that as a first cut or first order estimation of, of how your real processes are, but then you can connect that to data and actually validate what are the actual processes. So how long does it take to do this step within a broader process? Well, how long does the overall thing take and how much do pieces along the way take? Then you can make predictions that are actually anchored or grounded in reality. But the key is to have a process map and connect it to data so that you can, these are the questions everybody wants to know. How long is it gonna take and how much is it gonna cost? And the predictions that we render often, and am I gonna win So that is the third one, but people want these to know these things. And yet it's difficult for us to make those predictions because this has been a field that hasn't leveraged data like you see in the rest of the economy. That is changing. So if you can link and log every step in a process together, then you can both make sure your map greater reflects reality and you can make, you know, don't make a ridiculogram, obviously, which is, you know, you, you describe a process and one of the steps is staple, you know, you know, staple this or put this or, or you know, write, write this on there. It's got to be at like the right level of abstraction. But the idea is if you can make predictions again about individual steps in a process, then you can make process statements about the whole process like this. A matter like this should take nine to 15 months and 85% of the matters. And here's what lets you put you in the 15% category. And here's what this will cost. Here's the most common range and here's the second most common range. And is it's informed by the actual data. And here's what this little step within here generally takes. It takes 11 to 13 hours to complete. That's the type of precision that we need in this field with an engineering mindset. So we teach a full length class at Illinois Tech with our friends at SciFarth. John Dugan will be here on May 19th to give you an overview. So I just, you know, that's a preview. Today's really about previewing a lot of stuff. So that's another preview. So the last thing I wanna say before I pass it to Dirk, legal innovation, as I said earlier, has to be connected to the economics of law. So in the 2010s, we saw law firms beginning to transition their business model. And some of them are getting better and better at the product service bundle. And my view is that, and, and I said this, but I've said this many times before, that is gonna lead to a push for capital and a public listing in, in places where that's possible. So this was the first of the larger law firms in the UK to go public. They didn't get the greatest valuation in the world, but it, it, it's a harbinger of what's to come. And we just saw today, another one is, is planning to move in this direction uh, uh, of going public. Because once you nail the innovation piece, if you feel you have, you should get to scale as fast as possible. And that requires money. So to pass it over to Dirk, I just want to say uh, to everyone, you know, we welcome you here. We're very excited that, uh, uh, to have you here for, uh, uh, for these sessions. This is just an overview. There's much more to come. And uh, uh, um, it, it's, great to, it's great to have the band back together, all right? So now over to Dirk and Homburg for part two. Oh, th thank you again, Dan. And I'll try to pick up and do half as good as you did so far. Um, the way this works and the way all of this session is intended is to make sure that you have an equal level of understanding a couple of things that will get mentioned again and again over the course of the next four weeks, roughly. So this is by no means exhaustive, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a couple of things that Dan mentioned and drill down slightly deeper, and I'll add some thoughts. But the general idea is that um, you get a feeling of where you are, sort of a map of legal technology in the way we understand it here at Putzerios from an educational perspective. So happy for questions. Um, I think many things will become clear also over time when you look at the, at the next sessions where we have in-depth experts on many of these topics. But let's start by making clear that legal innovation, of course, is more than mere legal technology. We here are primarily focused on that but you will see that on our program, we'll talk about legal operations, we'll talk about legal design, we'll talk about many other building blocks of how you change the provision of legal services. And when I say legal services, I'm not talking just about the private market. I'm talking about dispute resolution on which we will have a session. I'm talking about uh, government and regulatory responses on which we will have a session. So this really is in a sort of um, a common baseline that I wanna provide for you guys. So. We remember legal innovation is more than mere technology. And let's start with, with an underlying assumption that we've, that we've made so far. We believe that lawyers manage risk and handle complexity. 
that is not the only thing lawyers do, but it's, it's an abstract way of thinking about many activities that lawyers or judges or prosecutors or people in other legal contexts are actually doing every day. So uh, this is not a precise description, but it is something on a higher level. And they do that in a legal market that is somewhat special. Many of you might know something about the business of law, but since I know that we have many students joining or people from neighbor professions, I think it makes sense to go back to the economics a bit and to figure out what the market for legal services is all about. First of all, we know that the legal market is full of information asymmetry. Legal advice is what is called a credence good. That is a good that you cannot really judge the quality of even after you have consumed it, even after you've bought it. Because many people come to lawyers for advice on matters that they do not know as much of or actually anything of. Now, it varies, of course, for lay people to people inside legal departments, but typically lawyers provide some form of expertise, and it can be hard to instantly know how much this, this was worth. By the way, that's why we don't have value-based pricing, but rather cost-based pricing. That's where the idea of billing by the hour comes from, because it can be hard for the consumer, for the person that actually gets the advice to figure out how much money that was worth in, in this particular point in time. Now, information asymmetry can be problematic because it can lead to bad quality in markets. If you want a rundown version of that and a very early idea, I suggest Akerlof's Market for Lemons to understand why people are incentivized to produce at lower quality since their customers are not going to see it. And that leads to a true race to the bottom because they can probably outcompete the good providers by just offering their services, lower quality, at a lower price. We don't want that, and that why, that's why we have strategies for ab avoiding bad quality. One very obvious uh, strategy that is in place in many markets across the globe is qualification. So we require you to obtain a certain certificate, study law, sit down for an exam, take a particular qualifying course, just to be allowed to offer legal services. That's what unauthorized practice of law is all about. Now, this is not universal because there are countries where everyone can provide legal services, but it is one mitigation strategy. Another one to avoid this uh, race to the bottom here is a price regulation. In many markets across the globe, the government has made rules on how much you're allowed to charge for certain legal services, on how much you have to charge de minimis for certain legal services. This is a strong way of interacting with the market. It's not something that's typical for a capitalist society, but we do it here because we do not want bad quality. Both of these um, measures, by the way, increase the price for consumers because someone has to pay for the qualification of these guys. And of course, people have to make money. And the only person to make money from, quite honestly, is the client. So in the end, the client pays for everything. That's for sure. But we also have let's say, less invasive mechanisms at play. Think about reputation. Now, this symbolizes the magic circle, which is a, a bunch of high quality law firms. You can think about other things like the big four in accounting or um, white shoe firms. Firms that have brands associated with high quality. They try to distinguish themselves from other firms and that's why they're bound to provide a good service because it might hurt their brand. But that's what's behind us, what, what's behind it. Had they not done this, um, it might be easier for that race to the bottom because of that information asymmetry. Those are three, uh, three ways of avoiding bad quality in the legal market. And we will see later on how that interacts this, this particularity of the market with technology solutions and innovative solutions to provide legal services. Dan has briefly talked about capital towards the end of his presentation, right? He taught, he, um, told us about some firms going public, actually accepting uh, money from the public, uh, public market. That's something that you can't do in many jurisdictions. Many jurisdictions clearly limit on who can provide capital to a law firm and who can own a law firm. Here in my home market in Germany, for example, right now, there is a vicious debate about that. It happens from time to time. But as of this moment, you can only own part of a law firm, shares in a law firm, so to speak, when you are a qualified lawyer. That means that you severely limit the amount of money available. But the idea behind that, for better or for worse, is that it avoids conflicts of interest between the people providing the capital and the people getting the legal 
uh, advice and service. People think that, well, if there's, for example, an insurance company behind a law firm, they might run into a conflict of whether or not to actually counsel a client to do something that might not be in the best financial interest of the company that owns them and so on and so forth. Now, this is not mandatory. There are many countries in which it's not the case that there are many countries in which we have even stricter rules, for example, that only partnerships, so natural individuals can form a law firm. We have other markets where you have so-called alternative business structures like the United Kingdom, where there's a lot less limitations. And we will discuss over the course of this series how these changes um, over the last, let's say, decade and a half and towards the future will affect the market of our legal services. Let's look at that market for a second and realize really how segmented it is. So we think about the market for legal services and depending on where you are, you think of an individual going to see a lawyer to ha get help with some form of legal complexity. Or you think, well, no, the market for legal services, that's actually companies getting advice and then having a large department. And if you look here, this is, by the way, from the great, uh, the, really the great scholar and, and good friend of mine, Bill Henderson, who we will have on this program also. He has looked at that for the United States of America. And you can, you can see that the individuals so of the consumer market makes up less than 30% of the overall market. And even the, the higher up market here is, is segmented. So while that's business law towards the, the like right hand of the slide, there are many different markets within the business law section. Now, when you make a product or service, it can be hard to deal with a with a heavily segmented market because it's not easy to provide one size fits all solutions if the clients are so different. I'll tell you what I mean. This is again, Bill Henderson's thinking. This is different types of clients depending on where you are on, on what, I, what I just showed you. So individuals typically only have themselves, but large companies might have several levels of legal experts. So we clearly understand that the same thing cannot be provided to both. There is a tendency that in the individual area, things seem to be more standard. And so you can probably work with a more productized version. And in the, in the, towards the other side of the slide, maybe there needs to be more of a service component because you have to tailor it more, but these trends are not universal. And I can find easily find examples against both, both of the assumptions I just made. I will highlight one thing though. Even within these types, you have very different people who in the end have to act on legal advice. Think of the difference between the general counsel who will have to counsel the board on a strategic decision uh, when compared to the sales representative who just needs to know whether he can actually sign a certain contract for something that he wants to, to sell or not. These are very different perspectives. And that is, again, another form of market fragmentation that can make it hard or at least not easy to be innovative and to come up with good solutions. Now, let's turn over to some work that uh, I did with our friends at BCG a couple of years ago uh, on, on different types of legal work and what they mean for technology. We started thinking about the whole market as consisting of basically two, um, yeah, two, two different ways that legal work uh, can be described as. There's standard work and then there's bespoke work. So some work, uh, is, is something that lawyers are like immediately familiar with, while others, you know, that this will require more in-depth assessment and, and really more time to craft it. And then there is, of course, generalists and specialists. So generalists um, see a lot of different types of work, but they're all, um, they, they don't have to get as deep into each individual section. Those were... For example, if you look at if you look at the idea that the German regulator had head of German lawyers, we were thinking about these individuals, generalists that are well versed in all areas of law that could be a criminal attorney today and then counsel someone on a commercial issue tomorrow. And then we have specialists, and specialists really sit in their niche where they have honed skills and knowledge very particular to that to that problem. And you can, you can drill that down as far as you want. You'll always find someone who does an even more specialized way of that. Um, think, of, think of people, for example, that only deal with a particular form of insurance claims. Uh, they're there, they're very profitable, but these are the different fields. Now, again, assumptions, you could say that big law firms tend to be in the bespoke specialist area, though they cheat because they, they have so many people that their offering can become generalist to some, to some extent. 
And then we say that smaller law firms are rather towards the bottom left of it. Now, again, th there are counterexamples. This is just um, this is just one way, a simplification to make a point. With technology and process improvements, this is how they can move. As technology helps you overcome productivity issues, as Dan has pointed out, you can start playing in a different arena. As a big law firm, if you have the right processes and products, you might be able to also move towards the, the standardized uh, market where there might be much money. And I'll, I'll tell you why that could be interesting because this is how we see legal technology progressing. Typically, people start to, to digitize offerings where you have many at low value and at low complexity. That's the generalist standard quadrant here. And then while they learn from that, while they gather data, they'll make their solutions better and they'll move on up from there. You see that, for example, when people start to tackle the consumer market where legal issues just in general might be a bit less complex than in the business law market. But once they are there, they can over time continue to invest in their products and then actually grow into that other area. So when the area, the quadrant that you're in is currently not so much affected by all of this, that's really no excuse to not do anything because sooner or later competition will come for you. That's why especially big law firms at, at which we looked in particular in this study, but to some extent also other providers need to rethink their business models. And I mean that in a holistic way. If you think about the value proposition, as Dan has told us, most, most of the time people come to get very specific legal advice. Um, the, the lawyers will offer, will offer that clearly, with, mainly through, through man hours, and they will build that uh, co cost-based, so by the hour. We believe that with the advent of, of raising complexity and also legal technology, clients will ask for more. They might, they might need on more than the law. They might need navigating the complexity. They might need advice on which technology to buy. So clients come with more demand. In the future, and sometimes if you look at innovative firms today, even in the present, uh, the, the offering is different. It's a mix of of individual human advice and maybe some products, maybe a platform, maybe a way of handling your contracts better. And that of course allows you to go for different pricing because that product part of your offering, that's something that's easily um, value-based, priceable. So, or you could go for a mix, right? So that, and we see that increasingly, we see that there is some fixed element in, of a fee. We do see that uh, some, some tasks, some law jobs are not paid for by the hour, even in big law. And while we have looked at the value proposition so far, let's look at the operating model. Nowadays, uh, law firms own at best one part of the value chain. That's the one they have in-house. But what happens before fact gathering, preparation on the client side, and what happens afterwards? So what do you do with that advice? How do you act on it strategically? That doesn't play a role. They have a cost structure that is mainly wages, mainly humans, that, uh, that's do not actually scale very well. I mean, one more human gives you some more productivity, but or some more units of law handled, to use Dan's uh, phraseology. But that's about it. And we know that the organizational structure is pretty much a pyramid, right? We know a few people on the top, a lot of people on the bottom. We think that through technology, it actually, th there'll be a chance to own more of the value chain. There'll be a chance to, for example, own the whole um, part where you actually discover the facts. If you have the right software, if, you, if you're able to cooperate with the right people, there might be a whole part that's today not regarded as legal work that you could probably do and bill a client for it and thereby own a bit more. That's, that's what this canned tomato is going to say as opposed to, uh, to the, I think it's a salad on the other side. Now, the cost structure, of course, is humans plus technology. So the, and that mirrors the offering. And that means that the way the economics inside a firm have typically worked by which you can very much ca calculate what you need in money this year because you know how many people you've hired might not work that well. Uh, software has very low, um, or has, has, has very low additional costs per unit, right? So if you, another piece of software typically doesn't cost a lot, but it might be very costly to actually build it in the first place. So the, the calculations on the cost structure will change. And of course, with, with all of that going on, uh, the organizational structure of law firms will change as well. That's the rocket here. 
Um, let me go into detail for that for a second. While what you see on the one side here in gray is what's known. Many people produce the, um, the large amount of hours that you bill for, then a few of them manage them, that's on the senior lawyer level, and then a couple of partners jump in for the on-point, most difficult legal advice and do all the management. So the people who are best at law are also in charge of really running the business of the law firm. We believe that in tomorrow's world, and again, in some, in some firms already today, there are other people on all levels. They do not necessarily have primarily a legal qualification, but they bring something else to the table. They could be double qualified like people who have gone through educational programs like the one we're offering. Um, some of them could come from different or allied professions, and you will see that they start coming in at the lower levels. Then soon on the, on the higher levels, on the management side, people will start to think about whether there shouldn't be a specialty for, for legal tech. You see these senior associate uh, positions around that. Maybe operations plays a role. Knowing about these thing, things plays a role in, in, in who gets promoted. And then, of course, also on the partner level, um, there will be changes sooner or later. The whole organization also becomes larger. It encompasses more, maybe not in the same firm, maybe in a, let's say, um, in, in one of those frameworks that Dan mentioned, maybe in, in, a, in, in an alternative legal service provider owned by a law firm, maybe in a tech company owned by a law firm, maybe in one they're allied with. So the general organizational structure will become more inclusive. That also means something for the way decisions are made. Classically, law firms, and I said in many, in many jurisdictions, that means partnerships, so individuals, uh, are geared towards consensus-driven um, decision-making. It's not that you need um, unanimous decisions, but it's very difficult. If you know all the people personally and everybody gets a vote, then one or two people alone can help or can slow things down dramatically. That is not always a bad thing, but it is something that's different when you look at other forms. If you look at the classical limited, if you look at um, institutions that maybe have a CEO and a small board where if you convince them, then they go ahead. There is a difference in how you make decisions and law firms in their current structure might have to start thinking about approaching this differently. And again, you see firms that, that um, create CEO positions. You see firms that... Um, that rethink the way they are structured also at the core level of decision-making. Now let's look, that's, that's enough about firms for the, for the time being, right? Because we have folks from all types of industry, but we know what, what's happening inside. We, we know what, what's happening strategically. I wanna invite you to also think about the competition out there, about how the market in total is changing. Dan mentioned uh, the big four. Now the picture, sadly, because I couldn't find a good picture of the big four global accounting firms, I went for the big five, that is, uh, big game, as they say in Africa. But the idea is that there is a global crew of accounting firms that have one advantage over law firms. They typically have global brands and they typically have some sort um, or, or, or more integrated form of organization on a global scale. Now, in some jurisdictions, of course, they're not allowed to practice law and they're finding ways around it, but their sheer size leads to them again and again trying to penetrate the legal market, doing so successfully in many jurisdictions, including my own, and just being a new player. Now, many of these accounting firms are organized in a similar way than law firms. Many of them build by the hour. So it's not like they are completely different and they have a core advantage, but they are a new player on these markets and they come with deep pockets and a very good understanding of processes from their accounting practice. I want to talk about um, law companies. Some people would say alternative legal service providers. I want to talk about these um, these firm, these companies. Uh, let's say like United Lex, Axiom, or uh, Elevate, that have found a new way of entering this market. They come from the lower side, where there's more business of law and not so much advice of law. From the from the side where you have all these tasks that can be difficult to organize, all the legwork, things that many traditional law firms would probably rather outsource, um, maybe preparation or pr provision of programs to, and, I mean, software and organization to work through large amounts of data, things like that. They come with a clear advantage in how they can actually get money or how they can get investment because they typically follow a traditional uh, in investment structures, like again, a limited or, um, you know, they might, they might offer shares easily. They come with a traditional model of how you can, how you make decisions 
They'll probably have a CEO. They probably have a board. They are for many of the the challenges that I mentioned. Uh, they are an answer, and they try to find their way into the market. You can see if you look at their market share that they are slowly successful, and you can see that they're not without challenges. In some jurisdictions, they are challenged because it looks like what they are providing is law. And remember, unauthorized uh, provision of legal services can be a problem. But if you talk to these guys, the part that is actually legal work in the in the regulatory sense is a very small percentage. It's a lot more of the surrounding parts that they try to grab. And then, of course, they try to also offer this at lower rates than law firms can. So while the bet the company case might be something that you do with a law firm, there might be a lot of run the company day to day case that um, th that you could outsource to a law company and that many firms and, and, and companies actually outsource to one of these providers. By the way, this slide is from Liam Brown. I should mention that he is um, he is a co-founder of Elevate Services. So of course, that's his perspective. But I wanted to um, make sure that you know about what's going on in, in the market with regard to law companies. And now the, the last form of competition, so to speak, in the market for legal services. You have seen this slide briefly in Dan's presentation. It's again from the great Bill Henderson, who looked at where new lawyers get hired. And if you look at that yellow line, that's in-house. So maybe the largest competition is coming from the clients. Well, it looks like they're certainly building up their very own law firms with just one client, that is the company. If you think about that, well, companies can take in uh, external capital very easily. Companies are mostly organized in a way that allows for quick decision-making. And they are faced with that increase in legal complexity that we've mentioned before, uh, actually a lot more directly than law firms are because it's their problem. They have to act on it. They need this complexity to be handled. So it makes sense that they try that they started and invested into more people. Then quickly finding out that that is not the only answer and that while that might help you with linear growth, it doesn't help you with an, uh, with an increase in complexity that is exponential. To tie this up, we've written two studies. Uh, the first one I've, I've quoted from is 2016, how legal technology will change the business of law. While the second one on legal operations, and you have a link here, is the one that I wanna spend a couple of minutes on. If you wonder on what Dan said about these, these trends in legal ops, if there is more to it, if there's actually more knowledge than just a mere ba buzzword, you'll find here a couple of of activities that we found through an, an ex, like expansive study of what people in legal ops roles do from vendor management, uh, knowledge management, of course, technology management. We found that they use particular tools, data technology, uh, data analytics, technology tools, um, the process improvement that Dan mentioned. And we, we found out that why they do it, what they want to achieve, as I, as I have it here, uh, resource efficiency, cost effectiveness, actually quality increases in the work they provide for other parts of their companies and then talent retention. You can drill down and go into details for all of these points. The study does it and we will do so over the course of the, uh, of the program, the essentials, but there is really a whole client side to all of this um, that's called legal operations. There are some pretty impressive results if you look at it. Turnaround times for contracts in one example that we looked at minus 50%. That's twice as many contracts, the same amount of time. Um, we saw annual legal cost savings of 5%. Now that doesn't look like much, but it's actually millions of Euro euros. In this case, I think it's millions of dollars though. But you get an idea that these things really matter and that um, something like budget predictability, if that increases, if you, if you can meet your target budget-wise more often, it's very valuable for a company and it might change the perspective of law firms from being cost centers to actually providing, and in some cases that we've looked at, even... Um, helping with, with the bottom line, even, even bringing in extra money. You see that in some industry sectors, take technology or take regula uh, regulatory intensive parts, the, um, the, the companies tend to have more legal operations. It also is a question of legal department size. There's a strong correlation. Big departments tend to have more legal ops folks. And then geography plays a role with the United States leading and then uh, the European market following. Uh, you can, again, get into details for the study, but I just want to tell you that there's a whole world out there um, with very interesting findings and that these folks, um, and many, I know many of, of the legal operations people are probably listening to this, they are a very important player in the market for legal services. Dan mentioned Clock, and I quickly want to say something about Clock. We will have Stephanie Corey, one of the founders later on in our series, 
and she will tell us about the humble beginnings. Now, the I remember one gathering of clock that took place here in Las Vegas because they had actually outrun the space that you can rent in San Francisco. So that should, from a couple of people in Silicon Valley, and again, please ask Stephanie to tell you the story of how it all started, to a couple of years later, over 2,000 people shows you what a massive trend this is on the in-house side of the legal market. Let's bring it together. Dan, in, in this paper that I quote here, has this model that what clients need, what people that need legal advice um, require is much more than just substantial legal knowledge. That's law and that is very important, but it's not the only thing because you can have the best legal response in the world. You need a good way to deliver it. It has to be designed in a way that, that someone can use it. And of course there might be an incredible number of technology parts in between. So really the experience of law is of legal advice is law plus technology plus design plus delivery. In all of these areas, you, you'll see how technology plays a role, how this changes over time. And after all I've told you about these different players, I think I should mention that you can of course combine them. Clients can combine them, it's called unbundling. Even law firms can combine them. Alternative legal service providers, there's any number of combinations to solve an actual client problem that requires probably all of these parts. Maybe some big law firms play a role, legal department plays a role. And then of course, maybe the big law firm brings in the new legal service provider. Maybe the legal service provider is brought in by the firm. So there are um, numerous combinations of all of this. Again, making this a, a market that's not easy to understand. That's enough of markets. I wanna spend my last minutes and I'm look and see that, that we are approaching an hour of, of content, which is what we're going for at Max, I wanna talk about legal education because I know that many of you are students and because I know that all of you care about what we do with the next generation of, uh, of law students and of, of lawyers. Uh, this here is uh, the T-shaped lawyer. It's an idea brought in by Armani Smothers. I think it's a former student of Dan's. You can have a look at, at like the explanation of the concept, but it basically applies the idea of the T-shaped knowledge professional from IBM to law where there is a substantive expertise in law. That is the dark area here, right? And then there are additional skills and qualifications. This is very helpful because for, for future lawyers, you can actually skill stack. So you can um, advance a lot by adding a couple of things outside your typical field. And for what I've described for this world where you need to see the business opportunities, where you need to understand the technology, it's really helpful to have a couple of, of skills from other fields. Some of them, of course, are business related, markets, business tools and acumen. A vast majority is the red part, the part we care, more, care about most, technology and data analytics. And then there's process and project management. You will see variations of this model, but it's basically all the same. It says, go beyond just one expertise and make sure that you get these extra skills. Here's an example for, these ex for some extra skills that we teach at Bucerios to our undergraduate students. Uh, there's an intro to computer science, there's an intro to programming, we talk about data science. We of course talk about the ethics of technology and law, but only after people have under, actually understood how the technology works and what it does. And then we do have hands-on like actual software development classes with our friends from uh, the University of Hamburg next door in their computer science department. What we're doing right now is part of this offering. So you see that the essentials are right in the middle here. Um, but there's also other parts like our summer program, uh, an LLM and MLB program that, that um, you can typically use the summer program for and get a degree. Um, there is the tech certificate that I just presented a couple of content from. And then there is the legal tech lecture, which is a, really our entry level. The blue stuff is what we're researching, but I just wanna, um, I wanna make clear that universities of the future, they need a whole bunch of offerings. And I also wanna make one point. If your students and your institution is not yet offering classes like these, be gentle because in education, it's really, really important to be right. Because if, if you teach someone um, and give them a professional qualification, that means that you're strongly determining uh, the outcome of their life. So if you get that wrong, that is a very high cost. That's why sometimes educational institutions are slow to adopt new things, really wanna be sure that everything's working out. Again, no excuse for not doing anything and make sure that you point to, to the innovative programs that you'll, that you'll get to know over the course of our essentials. I'm just saying, be gentle. 
that is really all I wanted to share with you today. Um, I really hope that you have a nice evening. Remember that the conversation continues on Twitter. And I think I'll give it back to Dan for a final goodbye uh, for this Legal Technology 101 session. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this session. It's our, it's our intro session. We'll see you again on Monday uh, uh, for uh, the official kickoff. It, it's, it's been great to be here with everyone. As Dirk noted, the conversation continues on Twitter and in our LinkedIn group. See everybody on Monday. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye from Chicago. And goodbye from Hamburg. <laughs>